Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Ronald Childs. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon with Ortho Virginia, and I'm stationed up in the Fairfax County region, the northern portion of our group. I'm uh, delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be here acknowledging Veterans Day, and I'm a proud veteran myself. A little background, I came to this area originally when I attended Howard University College of Medicine and stayed at Howard to complete my orthopedic residency, which I finished in 1989. My relationship with the Army came about because the Army paved my way through school. I was part of what's called HPSP program, which is the Health Profession Scholarship Program. So upon finishing medical school, you either go direct on active duty and train in the military, or you get a civilian residency, which I did. I did my orthopedic residency at Howard University Hospital. Completed that in 1989 and went on active duty. I was stationed in Germany, Germany initially in Stuttgart, really outside of Stuttgart in what's called Bad Cannstatt, the general hospital there. And I practiced there for just under three years. During my time in, in Germany, I deployed to the Gulf as well uh, during Desert Shield and Desert Storm. So I spent some of that time, about six months of that time, not in Germany, but in the Persian Gulf. I have to honestly say I enjoyed my German experience a little better than the uh, Persian Gulf experience, but I was uh, proud to be in both locations. Upon finishing my military uh, commitment, I did a fellowship in Chicago at Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center in spine surgery, and then came to Virginia where I joined a group of individuals, two doctors, orthopedic surgeons, and a physiatrist. And we later merged with a group and formed Commonwealth Orthopedics, which some years later merged with Ortho Virginia, and it's led to where we are now. I practice in, um, in the Innova Health Healthcare System, where I am the System Health Director for Spine, essentially overseeing spine in both orthopedics and neurosurgery for the program. And I'm a proud member of Ortho Virginia and delighted to be here and participating in this program. I'll pass your introductions now on to Dr. Christopher Kim, my partner. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Kim. I am a pediatric orthopedic surgeon practicing in the Richmond area, which is the uh, central portion of our uh, Ortho Virginia. I came to be in, in this group because of my uh, prior uh, friendships and associations with some of the people who have been in the military. Um, I came into the military because of a, uh, my undergrad and my medical school. Uh, like Dr. Childs, I went through the HPSP program but I came through the HPSP program from the United States Military Academy. So I, I did my residency at Walter Reed within the uh, military system in Washington, DC. Uh, I spent a few years at Fort Bragg uh, in North Carolina, also at Fort Gordon in uh, Georgia. I spent four years as the residency director at uh, in uh, Georgia, and I did my uh, pediatric fellowship in San Diego, California. And I have been in Richmond area for about 19 years now. And as Dr. Charles has stated, I am happy to be here today uh, celebrating Veterans Day. And also I'm very proud to be part of Ortho Virginia. I'll pass this on to Carrie. Good afternoon. Uh, I am also very happy to be here and honored to have served in the United States Navy for about 22 years. I recently retired. Um, in the Navy, I first started out in primary care, which is what most PAs do. And then I was fortunate enough to get selected to do an orthopedic PA fellowship. From that point on, I remained in the orthopedic specialty, working with all subspecialists for many years. I was also fortunate enough to be able to start to get our orthopedic PA fellowship accredited at Naval Medical Center Portsmouth which is recognized by ARCPA, which is a national accrediting body for physician assistants. So I have had the pleasure of serving many active duty retirees and their family members for the past 22 years. As you probably know, the military health system, we have very limited providers. We, we need more people to serve in the military healthcare system. And because we're limited, some of our patients do get referred out in town. And it is through this process that I learned about Ortho Virginia, because many of our patients were referred to providers in the local area, Virginia Beach area. And I heard great reviews about them. And as my time in the military was ending and I'm looking to continue my career, it is from patient feedback about the great service, great people that they worked with that led me to apply for Ortho Virginia. 
So I'm happy to report I've been with the organization for approximately one year. We have outstanding staff. We've recently opened an office in Chesapeake, Virginia, which is where I am currently stationed. And we are building that practice and are here to help with any orthopedic needs that civilians, military, retirees have. We, we are here for you uh, if you need to come and see us. So thank you to all the other speakers and their service and happy Veterans Day to everyone. Thank you all so much. If you are watching this live, please feel free to go ahead and ask your questions. We will be doing questions throughout instead of just at the end as we do in our other Facebook Lives. So I'll start with a question of what are some of the common injuries that you treated while you were serving? And do you see similar injuries in your patients today? Uh, any of you can take this question. So there are a lot of similar injuries, but there's also a lot of different injuries. So in the military population, I would see much more acute traumatic injuries, sports-related injuries, gunshot wounds, blast injuries. In the civilian sector, in my limited one-year time, I tend to see more chronic injuries, a little bit of an older population with arthritis, which we know the younger people will eventually get. But I think more sports-related and acute traumatic injuries in the military population versus the civilian sector. Excuse me, I would agree with that in my experience. I would also say it kind of depends on where you're stationed and then what's, what's going on at that time. So in the standard, I was in Germany in Stuttgart. I was in and where the UCOM was at that time. So I saw, even though I was in the Army, I saw all the branches on a regular basis. And you would see training injuries, as Carrie mentioned. A lot of, in fact, they did a lot of ACL reconstructions back then, shoulder surgery, shoulder reconstructions. A lot of injuries like that, sports-related injuries. Frankly, some overtraining type of injury as well. A lot of the people in the military are can be extremely highly motivated and will train well beyond where they may necessarily need to go. So you'd also see trauma. You'd see some injuries from people out in the field, fractures, femur fractures, hip fractures, that type of thing, jump injuries. If you're in the war zone, frankly, you see explosion injuries and, and, uh, and for, unfortunately, injuries of war. So it depends on the location and what's going on at that time. But you see the whole gamut of things. And when you think about how vast the U.S. military is, you also, um, some of like Dr. Kemp's experience, you can see tremendous variants in pediatric issues that, that because you have such a large catchment area. So it depends on your location and what that particular unit is doing, but you see the gamut of musculoskeletal problems. And even in war, 60 to 80% of all injuries involve the musculoskeletal system. So it's a very active need. As Carrie mentioned, there's a pressing need for people in musculoskeletal medicine in the military. My experience is very similar, but somewhat different. The, the two years that I spent at Fort Bragg, I did see <laughs> A lot of traumatic injuries, also a lot of sports injuries, but there was also uh, jump injuries. It's the uh, home of the 82nd Airborne, so there are a lot of people jumping out of airplanes and uh, injuring themselves. Uh, so during the two years that I was at Fort Bragg, I did uh, treat a lot of uh, significant trauma and, and also a lot of sports. Um, where we are in Richmond, we are, uh, we, our group takes call for a, a level one trauma center. So we still see some of the knife and gun club, uh, injuries, which, uh, are somewhat similar, but they tend not to be the high caliber injuries that, uh, that you will see in, in the military. Uh, so they are a little bit less of a, uh, uh really significant trauma, but it's still uh, it's still a uh, uh, bullet wounds and a significant trauma that we have to treat. Um, as far as the children are concerned, uh, as uh, everybody has said, we do have very limited number of pediatric orthopedic surgeons uh, in the military. Uh, in the Navy, I think there are about four or five. In the, uh, in the Army, we have six that cover the entire world. So kids tend to come from Germany to see people. So they, they get sent back and forth. And, and yeah, it would be really nice for people to be able to stay near home to be treated. Uh, I think definitely more, uh, more musculoskeletal uh, physicians, PAs and other providers are needed for the military. Um, and my, my time in the military I really, I really enjoyed meeting the families and, and the kids from all over. What do y'all think that your current patient can learn from your military patient? Well, in, from Fort Bragg, the people that I treated, 
uh, I really had to sort of sit on. They wanted to get back to doing the things that they usually did a little sooner than they should have. I, I think uh, the military population tends to push themselves a little bit more. Um, I think there can be a, a happy medium between the patients that I treat now and that military population. We want them to get better as fast as they can, but we don't also want them to hurt themselves while, while they're trying to get better. I think the other thing I would say, it's a little bit of difference. There's a different age population. You have a younger group of patients overall. While you still take care of retirees, everything when you're, when you're on active duty, you have a younger group of patients. And I agree, there's oftentimes a group that is extremely motivated. At Ortho Virginia, we do stress for patient involvement in their health care. For you to get better, it's um, you have to participate in your care. There's efforts on your side as well. And I think you found that as a as a common factor among most active duty soldiers you were treating. The idea you definitely had oftentimes to slow down rather than to uh, to have to push patients to participate and work towards their own uh, recovery. I would agree with the, what the others have said. Uh, in my military experience, it's fascinating because postoperatively we have structured rehab protocols for most injuries and the military population will break the rules on those protocols. So you have a patient who's not supposed to be doing pull-ups for three months and you see them at their two-week post-op visit and they were upset because they could only do three. Well, we have tested the limit. So I have definitely learned that. So slowing people down is, is very hard. And then sometimes motivating the, the civilian population with, you know, it is okay to do this. You can advance your activities, your range of motion, et cetera. A question just for you, Carrie. You said that you originally were uh, primary care patients and then you switched into orthopedics. So what do you like about orthopedics compared to primary care? I love everything about orthopedics. I sustained an ankle fracture at the age of 16. And from that moment on, I knew I wanted to work in orthopedics at some point, whether it was an orthopedic surgeon, a PA, I wasn't sure, but I knew I would be in the orthopedic field. The way the military works is you're required to do primary care initially. That's what the majority of PAs in the military focus on. But both the Army and the Navy have specialized fellowships because they understand how important musculoskeletal care is and how the majority of primary care patients in the military, 70 percent, are musculoskeletal injury. So they have progressed forward into offering these, these fellowships. I absolutely love about everything about orthopedics. I love sports. I love getting people back in the game, back in the battle as soon as possible and watching them go through their recovery process. So osteoarthritis is pretty common in veterans. Is there anything that uh, the veterans do that civilians could learn from or any tips that you have to share about that? My patient population doesn't have much osteoarthritis, so I really, I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> stay out of this one. <laughs> I can say one thing, and it was what was alluded to earlier, is I think the oftentimes um, people in the military will drive themselves beyond where they should be. So someone with severe three compartment arthritis of their knee probably should not be a marathon runner. At least that's what, that would be my suggestion. And so I think I would say one advantage is to not overtax the areas that that are severely arthritic or degenerative. I'm a firm believer in activity and participating being as active as you can, but not overtaxing the areas that are involved. That, that's, a, that's a small aside. Uh, but in general, I would say the Army's, the military, yeah, I was in the Army, so I'm a little biased. The military's uh, drive to try to maintain fitness, I think you can correlate well to the civilian world also. In general, the treatments we do are more successful, the more involved and the more fit the patient is. Everyone can can benefit, but the, uh, the more involved and fit and, and the patient is, I think you can pretend an earlier, better, more successful result. And just to add on to what has already been said, I think it's important to remain as active as possible as long as you can. Movement, we know, is good. Now, you might not be able to run that marathon anymore, but maybe you could swim or do elliptical or something a little less impact on your knees, for example. So I encourage all to, to keep in the game, but the game may change. You know, you're not playing competitive 
elite tennis anymore, but maybe you're transitioning to pickleball. So staying active, whatever method you can maintain at is important. So Dr. Charles, you were deployed in the Gulf. What were your hospital facilities like there? Were they regular hospitals? Back then there's a system called death med. So our hospitals were really a tent hospital. We lived in tents. The hospital unit was a tent, but a highly specialized tent with operating rooms and, um, uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't a hospital fixed facility. No, it was a tent scenario. It was a um, more modern, better equipped version of what you used to see on the old MASH, but much better. We set it up pretty quickly because we deployed early and we were capable of handling and stabilizing patients and getting them back to greater fixed facilities. But it was, um, it was a unit that could handle some fairly complex surgery, but our job really was to try to stabilize people, get them positioned so they could be uh, sent back to facilities and subsequently back to Europe or the United States. So I deployed from Europe and that's where a lot of our injured patients were eventually transferred to. So Dr. Charles was in sort of a secondary uh, hospital where I was uh, deployed to Haiti when we were supposed to jump into Haiti with a, uh, a very small unit, uh, two nurse anesthetists, myself, a thoracic surgeon, general surgeon, and an anesthesiologist. Basically, we had two beds and they weren't even beds. They were basically cots. They were essentially, we had a, it, it's sort of a little bit worse than what, what you used to see in MASH. It, it's basically a tent where we cleaned up, put together as best as we can, and then we ship them back to Dr. Charles so they can go on back to Germany and then the stateside. I need patience points out that there seems to be a big difference from their point of view between the military's electronic medical record system and commercial medical record systems. And was wondering if any of y'all had thoughts on those and comparing them. So I'm a little bit of a handicap here. The military did not have electronic records when I was there. They were very much handwritten. So I can't, I can comment about ours, but I can't comment about the uh, current military EMR. Yeah, the military EMR was just starting when I was getting out of the military in 2004. So I really can't comment on the military. And, I mean, it was very bulky and it was not user friendly at that point. But it, this is almost 20 years ago. Comment that it hasn't changed much. It is still <laughs> very challenging, not user friendly, not always functional. So we are still facing those challenges today with the military EHR. So are there um, any lessons from the military that y'all use in your patient care today? In the military, I mean, I trained completely within the military system, um, how to deal with families, how to deal with patients, that, that, that all translates. I mean, patient care is still patient care. No, no matter who we're treating, you want to show them respect. We want to be shown respect. We, we want to take care of these people the best we can. So I think the, whether it's military medicine or civilian medicine, the, the treatment of the patients and the families are the same. My time in the military also treats you, teaches you rather to be versatile, to be able to handle challenges, to be able to address them as a team to teach you some aspects of discipline, which is important, uh, or in teamwork, which can be important if you assume positions of leadership in your healthcare system. Um, it teaches you to approach a challenge, and it also makes you very experienced. I went on active duty straight out of residency, and I came out uh, very feeling very capable and competent about what I did. I felt I could handle uh, pretty much anything in the musculoskeletal system. Entirely. I felt uh, I'd had a great wealth of experience, uh, I've been placed in some positions of responsibility, and I felt that that would translate well into the civilian world, and it did. It's a reason, I think, that people coming out of the military, health practitioners coming out of the military, tend to be highly recruited across the country, because there's a certain level of confidence and acceptance known there. Particularly, I would say particularly in musculoskeletal medicine, because that's so much of what we do. I agree with everything that the others have said. I feel fortunate that working in the military, I have worked with an incredibly diverse patient and colleague population, including OCONUS, which is overseas, 
and working with local nationals in whatever area you're deployed, in addition to the diverse population of people that come in and join the military. So I think that skill, working with so many different types of people with different backgrounds, has made me a better person, more understanding of what other or patients may be coming from, uh, working as a team member and working together to complete the mission, which in the civilian sector I see as getting better, getting our patients better, working together with them. What do they need? What can I give? And looking at all different aspects of the patient's life slash environment helps to make me a better provider. So Dr. Kim, you mentioned that you treated a bunch of jump injuries. So what types of injuries are those? I mean, typically most common is still the ankle fracture. Um, and then it, it goes on from there. It all really depends on how well, well you land. The way they are taught to land really should include severe injuries, but you know, things always happen. There, it can be windy since they hit, they have night jumps. Uh, they have, uh, all, all kinds of different things. Uh, so I mean, basically everything from heel, uh, ankle on up to the spine fractures can occur. So we had another comment about record systems. Another question, which is saying that since different practices and systems don't communicate and faxing is still common, if any of you had any comments or ideas on a solution for civilian record keeping that is more cohesive. Well, I would say that the, right now the EPIC system is being used at multiple different places and it is really nice to be able to pull in records from other systems, but not everybody uses EPIC. So uh, it, it, it is difficult and trying to see x-rays from other systems, trying to see records from other systems. It, it, it would be nice to every, for everybody to be on the same uh, platform, but I mean, they'll, they'll never happen. I would agree. I think it's, I think we'll be able to, systems will be able to talk more and more with each other in time to come, but full universal communication is likely not going to happen. I, I just, I don't see a thing. And I would point out though, that as frustrating as these can be, there are some strong advantages. For example, in musculoskeletal medicine, we use films all the time. When I was a resident going to find films, which were always lost from the film library, is gone when you have digital radiography it, it makes that alone is a huge step forward um the, most of us uh, have horrible handwriting <laughs> you're going through residency so those are there's some benefits to electronic records that are absolutely here and here to stay but there the terms of the all the systems talk to one another that's going to probably be some time if ever i would agree i don't see the civilian sector ever having the ability to get the military EHR. Those systems are locked pretty tight. I think Epic is fantastic. It's been a pleasure to work with that system. So all of you have mentioned a few different times that you need to sort of slow military members down after surgery so that they don't try and do too much rehab. And you kind of need to sort of speed civilians up so that they push themselves a little more. Do you have any suggestion for individual patients so that they can have an idea uh, to gauge the right amount of pressure to put on themselves for recovery. I think I mentioned that, at least from my perspective, I would say I talked about the difference because the military population tended to be younger overall than the gamut of patients I see in a practice in the civilian world. Um, younger people, period, often are the ones who are pushing themselves regardless. At least with my own patient population, I do solely spine work, anything from the base of the skull down. I tell my patients, I want them to push themselves, but not hurt themselves. And that's what I'm looking for. If you're literally just that, hurt, push yourself, but don't hurt yourself. If you're doing something so much that you're dragging yourself home four weeks after surgery, that's probably not ideal. But if you're sitting down watching TV eight hours a day, four hours after surgery, that's not ideal either. So the idea is to stay active. And activity benefits you in so many ways, but push yourself, don't hurt yourself. I agree with Dr. Childs. I mean, we have a rehab protocol for a lot of things that we do, and we want them to sort of stay within those windows. And, you know, you can push yourself a little bit. We, we also don't want you to lag behind. 
I would also agree. We have a lot of rehab protocols and I also try to give my patients goals, expectations of where to be at which week or when the symptoms should start to improve or feel better. And along with red flags, if you feel this, you have pushed it too far, you have done too much. So you, you can get a gauge from your patients pretty quickly when you interact with them. You know the ones you have to push and you know the ones you have to slow down. And all of us have hilarious anecdotes. I use lots of little funny stories for my patients to give them examples of what to do and what not to do. And after a short period of time in practice, you'd have your own stories in that regard. Dr. Childs, this question is a little more for you. Um, are there any significant advancements in spinal surgery recently that you'd like to highlight? Spine has advanced tremendously uh, in the last 20 to 30 years. What we do um, is leap years ahead of my residency days. The fact that we do outpatient spinal surgery now, outpatient discectomies, outpatient cervical spine surgery, disc replacements, Patients get those and go home the same day. That was unheard of. You couldn't think of that 30 years ago. It's a standard now. So there are a lot of, as we do much robotic surgery has increased the accuracy and capacity of what we're able to do. So there's so much more we do and do better now, as well as recognizing how to rehab patients afterwards. There's just a plethora of things that you can apply. On the, on the osteobiologic side, we, I have been taking bone graft from a patient's hip in over 20 years. I did that routinely in the 90s. We have a lot of, uh, of uh, substances, a lot of, a lot of tools we can utilize to get patients to heal. Perfusions, for example, that lessen the trauma to the patient. Minimally invasive spinal surgery, again, is something else that has dramatically changed the, uh, the, the playing field. It really is, there really is no comparison to 20 plus 30 years ago and now. It's a different world altogether and a much better world and a better understanding of what makes people hurt and doesn't hurt. And not hurt, excuse me. Um, I would also say that we have a better idea of pain management with patients as well now than we did 30 years ago, 25 years ago. So as a, as a, on every front within spine, there's been dramatic improvements and, and they're ongoing. There's a tremendous amount of research there. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, how I operate on the scoliosis patients in my pediatric population is, I mean, it, things we didn't even think about back during residency. Um, and it, it, it is treme tremendously different. We do a better job of correcting the curvature. We do a better job of balancing the patient. Um, and like Dr. Charles said, I haven't taken bone graft even for my kids in about 25 years. Carrie, is there anything advancement-wise you would like to highlight? Even in the past 10 years, we've made significant progress in arthroscopy. We used to do open cuff repairs. Now it's arthroscopic. So I think in general, orthopedics continues to improve and advance every year. Do y'all miss, miss working with our servicemen and women, miss being in the military? One of the things I've missed from the military is that I was in an academic system, so I used to work with residents and teach residents. That is one of the things I do miss. I mean, the patient population is, you know, for my kids and the families there, I don't think that's that different. I did like the fact that I felt like I was making a difference in the lives of the families who were serving the serving our country. I will say that missing taking care of the people who are willing to lay their lives down to protect this country um, is something I took great pride in. I, I like taking care of people, period. I, I enjoy um, making people better. I love, I still get a thrill. All patients tell me they've ch I've changed their lives, um, whether they're civilian or active duty, but I do miss some access. I, I miss, frankly, also, when you're in the military, you tend to bond very closely with the number of people you work closely with, and those people are friends for life. And uh, so there are, those are aspects that I miss, but it's, um, but I, I still, I'll just say the reward of taking care of people, period, um, is a big part of what I think drives you into the means or the medicine period. And that's, that occurs civilian or military wise. It was certainly an honor to take care of folks who are again, willing to defend the country. The short answer for me is yes, but on the upside, we still see a lot of our active duty population get referred to us. So I do still have that connection, which I greatly appreciate and value. And just like Dr. Child said, the bonds you form with the people you deploy with and you take care of and you see on a regular basis cannot be replaced by anything else in this world. Thank you all so much. That's the questions that we have for today.
So would you all like to say a closing statement? Happy Veterans Day. Take care of yourselves. Same thing. Happy Veterans Day. This has been fun. I hope it was enjoyable and somewhat educational. And take care. Happy Veterans Day to all. And if you need any musculoskeletal care, please feel free to come uh, see us in Chesapeake, Virginia. Have a great day.